Well, look at this. This is a full uncut Giggity E3 2008 Xbox 360 live demo presentation with trailer featuring Todd Howard. Uploaded July, well, not uploaded, but this was originally posted July 15th, 2008. Wow. Okay, there's a little bit of, a, of the video that's muted, but they played the initial little trailer, and then as the trailer pulls out, please stand by. Oh, that 360 aesthetic, man. Oh, it was a vibe. Then the man comes on stage. Bethesda Game Studios. Let's see him. Look at him. He's just a baby. He's just a little baby. You just saw the first half of a trailer that is going to debut online in just a few hours and on Xbox Live. We think it gives you a great look at both the harshness and the humor of the world of Fallout 3. You know? Oh, and dude, you remember the 360 controllers with the huge ass battery pack inside? You shove those double A's in there, show them who's boss. Oh, those were the days. Those were the days, man. 2008. Todd also, I don't know what it is. He's, he doesn't do this anymore, but when he was really young in all these interviews, he does this thing where he talks like his upper lip, super stiff. This is our reveal of fallout three. And we think you're going to be super stoked with how amazing it looks. Not a lisp. He doesn't have a lisp, but his upper lip is weirdly stiff. And now that I mentioned it, you won't stop looking at his upper lip and it will drive you a little crazy. Cause you're like, what is going on there? But he doesn't do it now. He like grew out of it. He was doing it in his 30s, but now he's in his 50s and he's not. I think he's in his 50s. When we did Oblivion on the 360, we took a lot of risks and we learned a lot from doing such a massive game on the platform. We've taken all of that learning and applied it to Fallout 3. We're ecstatic to show publicly for the first time here today, Fallout 3 demoed live. Let's take a look. Live demos, man. Those were the days. Those were the days. Xbox controllers are still like that. Yeah, you see, yeah, you still put like batteries in them. I have one down here. I know, but it doesn't have the fat, juicy, chunky, like bulge. Controllers used to have that. And it was awesome because like it gave your your fingers something a little more tactile to bump into. That's, those are the controllers I grew up playing on. I still remember the very first time I ever held an Xbox 360 controller. We went over to my Uncle John's house and he had Call of Duty, I want to say three. It was like the World War II one, whatever that was. And uh, he had he had that. And I remember holding that controller and I had only ever like played on a PS2 before. And PS2 just had the little, you know, bumper buttons that were just... They, they weren't analog. They didn't have physical movement to them. It was just click or not click. And when I held the 360 controller for the first time, and I remember feeling like it felt like you were actually pulling a trigger when you fired the gun in the game, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. It was amazing. It's great. Man, those were the days. It was so easy to be impressed. It was so great. A live demo. So here's Fallout 3. The game takes place in post-apocalyptic Washington, D.C. in the year 2277. What color should our game be? Green or gray? You can pick two. <laughs> that, that is Fallout 3. It is so, so monotone. But that, I mean, a lot of games during this era were. I don't know what it was about, like, the, this era of gaming, but, like, that art style and that color tone was just the vibe. You can play in first person or third person. Here I am. I've left the vault, Vault 101, where no one ever enters and no one ever leaves. Here we have an iBot broadcasting the word of the Enclave, the last remnants of the US government. On my wrist is the Pip-Boy 3000. Here you can check your stats, various things. Now we see this and we're like, yeah, it's Pip-Boy, it's whatever. But back in like 2008, unless you played the original like CRPGs, this was all extremely novel. And if you did play those original ones, I'm sure this was bafflingly cool. Like this was, oh my God, it's an actual thing, wow. Skills you can raise and perks. I happen to have the uh, bloody mess perk, which lets people uh, 
die in ridiculously violent ways. Uh, I also have various weapons that I can kill people in ridiculously violent ways. And I also have radios, so I can pick up broadcasts that are happening out in the wasteland like Enclave Radio. Someone should tell Todd that um, in 2023, those would no longer be necessary. You could have a Bethesda adventure game. Just don't do any sort of music or or uh, radios or anything. It's all crap. So this is a game where you can play any kind of character you want. You can play a stealthy guy, a combat guy, or use speech to persuade people. Try to be, you know, good with the ladies and all. You can also play the game combat-wise, like I'm going to. You can play in real time. Or yeah, this Starfield expansion looks great, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't this look great? <laughs> Dude, that's what I should have done for, for April Fools. I should have posted a video of, like, a Fallout 3 obscure recording and be like, I got early access to the Starfield Shattered Space expansion. <laughs> it's just this. Oh, man. Oh, that would have been great. Or you can press the right bumper and use VATS. Next the time. Vault Tech Assisted Targeting System. So you can queue up moves on various body parts and then press A to see what happens. That, uh, that never gets old. I'm gonna switch to grenades here. This is where the content might be inappropriate for some audiences. Switch to my combat shotgun. Oh, dude, the combat. But I appreciate I the, the live demo. Band music that nails it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the world you have to find to survive. Food, water, help you out. There's a turret up here that's giving me trouble. Oh, Todd. I could hack this computer and take control of the turret if I want, but I'm going to switch to my laser rifle. See if I can take it out. Vats is actually kind of genius because when you have a really clunky gunplay system it's like oh just go in with vats and it'll just aim for you so you don't have to struggle with it and the weird like the the the, the whatever it's called the the sensitivity curves in bethesda games i've always had problems with because by default they're always just off they don't feel quite right when you're playing on controller it takes some like getting used to or tweaking but vats covers that up a lot that's really helps with it I don't know what it is. I, it's well above my pay grade to understand it. I just know when it doesn't feel quite right. Again, this is a huge game with over a hundred hours of gameplay. It's a wide open world. You can walk right down to the center of Washington DC and ride the elevator to the top of the Washington Monument. We have a sentry bot up here. These are robotic tanks that are patrolling the wasteland. They're pretty tough. I'm gonna switch to my missile launcher. Try that with bats. Switch to a pulse grenade. This will give him an EMP blast. Look at this, man. Live demos, dude. And again, this is a game that reacts to how you play it. You can be a good person, you can be a bad person, or anywhere in between. Perhaps you'll make friends with the Brotherhood of Steel who have turned the Pentagon up here into their own personal citadel. It's the Enclave. They've spotted me. Look at that. Yeah, they have. They've spotted me. So I, these guys are tough. So I'm going to switch to... The Fat Man, which is uh, a mini nuclear bomb catapult. Every kid wants one of these under the Christmas tree. <laughs> it's gonna line these guys up. Again, Vats again. There go the frames and the on. Pretty effective weapon. So that's our demo 
of Fallout 3. Hope you all enjoy it this fall. Isn't that just kind of fun? Isn't that fun? What? Dude. Dude, my algorithm is on point. That's wild. Yeah, the fat name, fat man wouldn't fly na nowadays as a name. Yeah, they'd have to call it the the large being <laughs> or something. You can't can't the the plus size launcher, something like that. Yeah, Luke, with you being an expert in all things Todd, how well do you think he'd do in a post apocalyptic America? I I don't know any of the inner workings of Todd's daily life, despite what Reddit may think. I have not spent time with him or anything. My understanding is that he likes the finer things in life. You know, when he was on stage at E3 2019 with Elon, he talked all about his, his uh, love for fancier cars and dinner parties and stuff. So I think he's a bit bougie. I'm not sure if he'd, if, if he would survive, it would be like as, as a, uh, a mogul or something, you know, running a faction basically, which honestly, if, a fallout apocalypse were to hit and i found out that i was living close to a faction that was run by todd howard the guy that made the games that covered this stuff i'd probably go and join his army let's be honest we all would just imagine that it'd be great follow him blindly that's what we would all do um <laughs> Luke, this made me want to replay Fallout 3. Yeah, like, here's here's the dealio. Fallout 3, it's really easy for us to go back and, like, look at all this stuff and be like, wow, it's so crap. But, like, by 2024 standards, it better be pretty pretty outdated. Like, we if we've not come a long ways in 16 years, something very bad has happened, right? But, you know, this is a reflection of its time. And at its time, it was cutting edge. It was stunning and very very novel and unique so yeah like the vibe and the color palette is is very 2008 and by today's standards we'd be like this looks really flat and lame but that's because we're not living in 2008 this was a game made for the audience of the time and for the time it was really really good also at the time uh players had higher tolerance of, uh, to excuse me higher tolerances for certain things like bugs or glitches and and weird behaviors of, of games and stuff. And that's why Fallout 3's clunkiness was forgivable. I, I remember watching a Mr. Matty Plays video back but in the like the lead up for Fallout 4 back in like 2013, 2014. And I remember hearing the community that was really into Fallout talk about how Fallout 4 probably is going to be a little glitchy when we get it, but it'll be fine because we've been waiting long enough and, you know, that's just part of the Bethesda charm. And that's what people used to call it. They used to call it the Bethesda charm, all of the clunk. And that was an artifact of the time, I think. Uh, I don't think that they can get away with it anymore. But back in 2008, beggars couldn't be choosers. And so when you got a game, you were just happy you got it. And if it was a little buggy or clunky, yeah, it's it'd be great if it wasn't that way, but it's just part of what we've come to expect, you know, from them. But nowadays it's not tolerated. And honestly, the VAT system is a genius way of dealing with the combat not being great in Fallout 3. I mean, it's it's an example of them coming up with a feature, I think, that enhances the gameplay significantly. Instead of just adding on another side activity for you to engage with, it actively makes another system really, really good and makes it better. And so, you know, this stuff, all these levels, I remember, and I, I've explored these levels just like you guys have. You know, it's not as as smooth as the live demos making it out to be with the, the vertebrae just landing right in front of you just so nicely and everything. It's it's usually a little bit more stilted than this, but it's a game that was made for its time and it was really, really good at the time as well. Nowadays, you'll play it and it will show its age, but it still is a remarkable game and I think they do deserve some credit for it. If it released as it is today, of course, it would be, uh, it would have major problems or be issues with it, but for 2008, BGS was at the top. BGS were were at the tippy top of their game. And it's just a little surprising to see how they've they've struggled to kind of evolve with the times. And I think that's the bigger thing. It's like there's a time when when they were at the cutting edge. Um like the one of the other funny clips I saw a while back was was uh Oblivion at E3. 
let me see maybe making of oblivion i think this is it so there's a full documentary on this maybe we'll watch it on stream one day but they eventually took oblivion to e3 it's got good epic fantasy demon stuff at the end which i think the kids like forests Yeah, the force stuff for us has always been the kind of rendering wise, the craziest thing that we trying to do. And the thing that also is, has the biggest visual impact of the game. People see it, wow, you know, I've never seen that before. Usually when building a scene like this, I start out by. This was funny because they, they were showing the, <laughs> the process of it and they filmed it by pointing the camera at like the computer screen and then using the reflection of the person instead of doing a separate like computer screen capture and stuff. It's really, really funny. It's very 2008. But um, where do they go to E3? Because there's a part where they go to E3 and everybody's talking about how amazing the graphics are. So how about this? How about a brand new, full-featured, next-generation role-playing game in the launch window? Morrowind was one of the best-selling role-playing games ever on the Xbox. The sequel to this incredible game is called Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. It promises to feature one of the largest open-ended worlds ever created for a video game. It also includes thousands of characters that are governed by brown, groundbreaking AI. These characters eat, sleep, and complete tasks all around the clock. And they make their own choices based on what's going on in the world around them. Welcome to the world of Oblivion. Hi, I'm Todd Howard of Bethesda Softworks, and uh, welcome to our presentation of The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. That's what E3 used to be like. It was like little rooms where you'd go into private seating areas and then there'd be a dev that just shows you the game and then you you go about your business. And some parts of E3 when I went in 2013 or 2019 were still like that. We had a couple of meetings that were like this when we saw like the um, Marvel Avengers game. It was like this. It was a very small group that got to see it. Same thing with Cyberpunk 2077 when we saw that behind closed doors. It was a very similar thing. There's still remnants of this, but I think people imagine most of this stuff is like big showrooms and conference halls and stuff. Uh, or concert halls and it's just not how it typically was it's usually people from like IGN and GameSpot and people just sitting in chairs like this right next to Todd and he walks them through the game this game looks, looks unbelievable it actually has trees unlike Bardenfall the whole first level of the game is a prison break um, and through your actions, it really determines what kind of character you'll be. I mean, sometimes I worry that uh, games are going to get so realistic looking that I won't want to play in them because they're, uh, they're too real and then I might as well just be at home. Only this was a pretty good case for hyper-realism because the forest was, was gorgeous. Hyper-realism. <laughs> yeah, like, dude, that whenever... Like you catch yourself talking about like, oh, this game is, is so crazy realistic, you know? And then we fast forward a few years and we're always like, wow, we thought that was like hyper realistic. It's the same thing when I, I look back at like the last of us part two, I remember seeing the original clips of, of like Abby when she's getting uh, like strung up onto the tree. I remember seeing that and be like, that is extremely photorealistic and it still is very very good but you know it's still a video game you can still tell and so to look back at this and hear people talking about how this is like this is pretty photorealistic i can't I, we're getting close to the point where i can't even tell what's real anymore i'm like bro it's easily the most impressive game that we've seen yeah, it's like with the radiant ai thing yeah that's always that's always one of my big issues with rpgs is the npc characters It's so much more entertaining to watch like somebody flame their dog. 
Can you imagine if they put that in a demo today where it's like, yeah, this lady got upset at her dog for barking. So she lit it on fire. People would be like, cancel this studio. This is ridiculous. They shouldn't be tolerated. It's wild. Man. Yeah, dude, the original Final Fantasy VII was a marvel at its time. Looking back at it now, it's just a bunch of triangles got into a fight. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is... That, but this is why I bring all this up. It's because it's all relative and these games are built for the times that they're releasing. And it's easy for us to look back and then retroactively point at things and, and complain about things or, or critique things. Um, but it's why I haven't done like a lot of critiques and stuff for games that I was not present for. Because like I, I wasn't playing games at, at the time that Fallout or, or rather like a Oblivion came out so me critiquing it would just be from my current perspective and i'm not sure how valuable that is when it's a game that was made for 2006 audience and i think it's important to to be able to remember what market these games were built for and also i mean that can also flip the other way where you know you look at a game like a, a starfield and that game is lacking because it's coming out in the time that it is and because for 2023 audience it did not live up to the standards that they had set forward. So like audiences evolved and change uh, or evolve and change. And these studios have to do this really tough thing where they have to not just adapt and evolve with the audience, but they have to see where it's headed and meet them there. Like they have to know where the market's going to be in five years when this game is coming out. Otherwise you end up with a game like a Suicide Squad that's been built pretty much originally designed in 2017 when it probably would have done pretty well if they had dropped it right then and there. But it took so long to actually get out the door that by the time it releases, it's terribly out of date. It feels like an, uh, an old game that's monetized and built in really outdated manners. And it does nothing new or fresh. And so devs have a tough job, certainly. But that's why, you know, they are charging 70 bucks a pop for AAA games you know it's it's literally their job you know uh if starfield had released before no man's sky and star citizen then it probably would have been seen as an amazing game at the time but it's just not acceptable anymore yeah and i i think that that's probably fair if it had dropped in 2015 like if you replaced fallout 4 with with starfield i do think that it would have been received way better but in the age of No Man's Sky, especially post updates and expansions and in the age of Star Citizen and everything and with the modern like open world data streaming where you're just able to to freely explore in all of these games without any load screens or anything, it just feels really outdated. And that's the that's one of those things where I think gamers just are not as tolerant of it as they used to be. Mm -hmm.